the the classes up the first two classes are up on YouTube now in case you want to look them up just Christology Father Westoff usually it'll it'll get there to you let's open in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen Heavenly Father we ask you to send forth your Holy Spirit upon us and guide our lesson tonight that as we study how Jesus has the qualities of human and yet divine we ask that you guide our lesson and we may reveal what we need to hear about ourselves as well we ask this through the intercession of our blessed mother as we say hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen Okay, so if you didn't get a hand handout there in the back, we also have extras from last week. So uh, across the top there, I got the quote from Hebrews that is actually going to be like the theme of the night, if you will. You know, this, this is the verse that we don't need to memorize, but we should have it in the back of our mind. It's a beautiful little uh, verse from Hebrews. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. This is from Hebrews chapter 4, and Hebrews is a wonderful uh, piece of literature that really, gets, that, that really gets to the heart of that Jesus is our high priest, but yet, like the verse says, like us, but better. You know, he's been tempted. And as I was thinking about how to tie in last week's introductory lesson with the, the end point of what I'm uh, get to at the end of the night, that above all, that I think that there's a lesson to be to find out in um, the temptations, the temptations of Christ. I'm sure all of us have heard this numerous times. Uh, there's many different launching pads that we could take to get to the humanity of Christ, but I think that this today would be the best one to, to start with. And there's many things about the temptations of Christ, but we're going to we're going to see how it ties into last, week, last week's lesson, but also gives us a launching pad to where we can see more about the humanity of Christ. So uh, the first part is like tempt. Like what does the word tempt mean? You know, commonly, let's go back to that one. We, it, it means the test. We, we always use it in the version of like a negative test. Like you know, we're going to see if this, per we're going to tempt this person to see if he sins. But it's, sometimes it's actually like a, a positive connotation. Like you want to you test something. You want to test something to see if they are good enough to qualify. You know, anytime you take a test in, in uh, uh, c college, high school, whatever, you're, you're testing them to make sure that they actually absorbed what they're supposed to. You're, you're testing them. So the word test and the word tempt are very similar in that regard. When I was working construction, it was kind of a, a joke saying, but it was a little bit true is that when you build scaffolding and you put scaffold planks across and you put these wooden two by tens across to walk on, it, the joke was never, never trust a board that doesn't bend. Because when you walk on them, if they bend, then it's gonna hold you. But if they don't bend, they're just gonna snap. But you have to test them. And it doesn't matter how well you built your scaffold, it doesn't matter if you did it exactly right. That first step out there was like, oh, okay. All right, everything's good. Everything's good. It's, it's sturdy enough now. You tested it. That first step was always a little leery. No one ever just jumped right out there because maybe something didn't latch right. Maybe the, they, the board didn't sit in there just right, or maybe they didn't put the other side on full, the full way. So that first, that first test was scaffolding was to make sure, like, is this going to be safe? You bounce on a little bit, bend a little bit, like, all right, this board bends, we're good. If it didn't bend, usually it just snapped. And then you fell. So uh, never trust a board that doesn't bend. So anyway, <laughs> as far as the temptations of Christ, we see that this is kind of like a, we think, oh, he's being tested in a negative light. Well, you can say that because the devil's absolutely, absolutely doing that, and that's true. But there is an element of he's being tempted to show that he's worthy of the mission that the Heavenly Father gave him. Now, could he fail? We're going to talk a little bit about that later. But the... The idea is that he's being tempted here in a number of ways. And we're going to walk through some of the, these ways because they coincide with exactly what we talked about last week. And I think this is super interesting. Um, so, oh, by the way, we're talking about the temptations according to Matthew. 
because they are in a slightly different order but uh, in Matthew and Luke, but in Matthew's order, this is the one we're covering. And what we're finding in Jesus and the temptations in the desert, he is doing many things, but there's two main, I would say there's two major things here that he's really doing. Number one, he is reliving the life of Israel in the desert. He is, it's called a recapitulation. He is redoing it, and he's, now he's doing it perfectly. But then also, the temptation part is to test him to see if he's worthy. Of course he's worthy. He's Jesus. But it's the idea, he, we know this. We know he's being tested in a positive light, not the negative light. So we're going to go through a little bit of this, of him reliving the, the life of the Israelites in the desert. So the first temptation for the Israelites was they got out of Egypt. They ran through the, the desert. And before they know it, they started to complain. We're starving here. Why would you leave us out of Egypt just to starve here in the desert? There was food back in Egypt. Now we're out here in the desert. We're going to starve. Their first concern was like, are they going to have a full belly? Are they actually going to prosper? And you can kind of see this too because their first concern was that when they went to the promised land and they would even look at, they would look at the promised land, they would, uh, they would say like, oh, we can't do it. But the, the people there are prospering. We, we, don't, we don't stand a chance. Their first worry was like, are we going to like survive and prosper instead of having trust? Now, that, that first temptation for Jesus was the same thing. Oh, if you, the devil said something to the extent of, you're really hungry, turn these stones into bread. He is reliving the same storyline as the Israelites. If you are really God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone. So he, that's the first thing he's taking up. The second is the salvation through miracles. The Israelites, after the manna, which they were fed for a long time, they continue to see other miracles. The, ser the, the serpent on the pole. Mount a serpent on the pole. If you look at it, you'll be healed. Water from a rock. They, they continued, uh, the, the, that God continued to shelter them. He let their clothes uh, last a lot longer. You know, he, he gave them what they needed through these miracles, and yet they didn't trust. They, there was a, a big debacle with Moses and Aaron and Miriam th that they doubted him, and the earth opened up and swallowed a couple people. They, they continued to doubt Moses' leadership and that the miracles, even that he did. So there's this idea that the salvation through miracles, they really took, uh, they wanted to continue to see miracles in the desert. And then salvation through political power. That uh, th this was a, a, a rise in Judaism. This is after the desert. But that their political power, they wanted to know if they were going to be a nation. They wanted a king. They, uh, Solomon and David raised all this. So we talked about the manna coming down from heaven. I kind of put this in a, in a wrong order. I should have went sideways when I went down. But then all the miracles done through Moses and then... We have the rise of the kingdom through Saul, David, and Solomon, right? These were the big parts of Judaism. And if we look at the same exact relationships from last week, if you remember the same relationships that we talked about, there's three sets of relationships that we talked about that Jesus had with people. The first were the disciples. And we'll talk about that part that the disciples are in this top column, the Pharisees are in this middle column, and the bottom column are the revolutionaries that they, they wanted to see salvation through a certain thing and not through a suffering servant. So this coincides with the relationships. We hear in the Gospels that he has a great number of disciples, but some of them would leave because they wanted to be successful. We hear about this in the story of, of the, the mother of James and John. That the mother comes up and runs up and says, can you put James and John on, on, on your right and on your left? She wasn't really concerned about salvation. She wanted to see her sons be successful. We hear about in John chapter 6 that Jesus does this miracle of feeding thousands. And then he, he moves away and people follow him. And the first thing they're concerned with is like, are you going to fill our bellies again? They don't care about the miracle. They care about like, are we going to be prosperous here? And when they found out that they weren't, when they found out that this was going to be tough, John 6, 
uh, verse 66 even says there were many people who stopped following that day. So this disciples, the, the group of disciples, and I have no doubt the vast majority of them were wonderful. I mean, they wouldn't be disciples if they didn't get it. But there were some disciples that did follow Jesus just for the sake of prosperity. They were in the same kind of group of people who just wanted to be fed. That would have went back to Egypt. That would have said, like, uh, ah, but better if we just that stayed in Egypt and remained slaves as long as we had our bellies full. Because the people who followed uh, Jesus in John chapter 6, there's a sharp divide. The people who left Jesus... Because they, didn't, they couldn't uh, take the, the lesson of the Eucharist. So on your paper, I kind of put this, uh, I, I need to explain this because I didn't um, do a very good job in the afternoon session. There's three parts in, in um, uh, italics that kind of mentioned anti-disciples, anti-Pharisees, anti-revolutionaries. These are Jesus' quotes and what he says to the people against that type of thought. That type of thought, like the anti-disciples, he's, he's never really anti-disciple, but the people who are just there to be prosperous, these are what he kind of says to them. You know, I think this is the downfall of Judas. Obviously a disciple, he was an apostle. He thought they were just going to be successful. He, he was in it for the money. He mentions this when he talks about the, the costly nard that was waste, wasted to treat Jesus. And ultimately, that's the part that makes him tra be, become a traitor. He's hungry for money. He wanted to be prosperous. He, he didn't sign up for this suffering part of it. So Jesus rebukes this. And the temptation in the desert for him is to become this type of Messiah that just makes his people prosperous. So now we're blurring this into, is like the temptations in the desert were also temptations to become a different type of Messiah than once originally planned. The first temptation of him making bread, I mean, we hear this, right? Sometimes there's always an analogy that, you know, what are you working for? Put food on the table. I mean, obviously you're working for money, but it's ultimately to put food on the table, right? You work for bread. One of my favorite movies, Cinderella Man, the story of this boxer in the Depression, and they asked him, what you're fighting for? What's your, what's your motivation? It's like, I'm fighting for milk. He was a broke boxer. It, it, that's the same thing. It's like Jesus has this temptation of being a, a Messiah that is just meant to bring prosperity. And we see this. There's prosperity preachers all around. Give the church some of your money and you'll be taken care of. God will take care of you. That's not what the gospel's about. The gospel's never been about prosperity, uh, uh, the prosperity gospel. You know, just love unconditionally and where that takes you, it takes you. But to think that we're just going to be successful because we're Catholic or uh, we're going to have plenty of money because we uh, tithe, that's ridiculous. That's not what Jesus came to do. And I think this is a temptation in the desert for Jesus to uh, step away from his full suffering servant mentality and say like, oh, I could just make everyone successful. That's what Jesus, that's what the devil's trying to tempt him into. So uh, we can see that Jesus is not only being tempted with hunger, he's being tempted at becoming a different type of Messiah. And again, the Pharisees, they were massive on just seeing signs. They wanted to see the miracles. They were in love with Moses, and rightfully so. But Moses was not, not their salvation. And they would say, there's a couple times in the Gospels where they even said, you know, we had signs in the desert. What kind, what kind of sign can you give us? And that's where we get this lesson right this uh, quote from scripture right in the middle Jews asked for many signs many times even after Jesus did miracles it says the Pharisees and Sadducees came to him to test him asked him to show them a sign from heaven he said to them in reply in the evening you say tomorrow will be fair for the sky is red and in the morning today will be stormy for the sky is red and threatening you know how to judge the appearance of the sky but you cannot judge the signs of the times an evil and unfaithful generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. So th this, this kind of part where he's talking to the Pharisees is they're strictly putting their faith just in the miracles that Moses did. And now they, they're, they're trying to push Jesus and say, uh, look, what, what kind of sign can you give us? 
Jesus rebukes him and says, you don't even know how to read the signs of the times. What, what's going on? Like, you know how to read the weather, but you can't tell when the Messiah is right in front of you. That's how ill you're actually reading the signs of the times. So he's becoming this, um, uh, the, now in the desert, he's having this temptation too, to become just a miracle worker, just to do the miracles. Now, obviously, the miracles are the good things. I mean, he cure, cures the blind, cures the lame. Uh, uh, walks on water, does these great signs over and over again. But the Pharisees just want more. They just want more signs. It's like, oh, as long as you're working miracles, we, we will follow you. We will trust you. So he's, the devil now is trying to give him actually this, this second temptation of just being a miracle worker. Just, you know, just be a miracle worker. Lose that idea that you need to suffer anymore. And uh, you can just become that type of messiah. And then we, we, we even continue to hear this, the thieves on the cross. If you are the Messiah, save yourself and us. We hear that from the devil. Save yourself. He, he, and he doesn't need that. And then third, the salvation through political power. Even the apostles asked, this is after the resurrection, even some of the apostles asked, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And at the crucifixion, we have the sign, the king of the Jews. And that whole interaction with Pilate, that Pilate is asking him, are you a king? You know, at this time, they're kind of thinking like, oh, we want that, uh, that Messiah who is going to be a king and, and, and bring Israel back to its original glory. Kind of like how Saul, David, and Solomon did. The third temptation in the desert is the devil taking him to the peak of the temple and saying, see how far you can see all the kingdoms. I will give them to you. He's having a temptation of becoming a political leader, a different type of Messiah. But obviously, he's Christ. He doesn't fall into that trap. He's not going to. But that's the kind of temptation of him being in the desert, being there for 40 days, and now he's reliving the life of Israel where they failed in all this regard because they whined after they got manna, they whined after they got the, Messiah, the miracles from Moses, and even when they got the kingdom, they begged for a king, when God said, and Samuel said, you don't want a king. Once you get one, you're not going to like it. They said, give us a king. We want one anyway. We want to be like the other nations. They got what they asked for. And uh, this is where Jesus is not only reliving the life of Israel, he, he's doing it right. And this is the, the part where we put ourselves in the story when we ask ourselves, what kind of Messiah are we looking for? Are we looking for one who died for our sins to set us right with God? Or are we looking for a Messiah, whether it's a political Messiah? Are we, are we Catholic because just to be prosperous, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But uh, um, are, we, are we in Catholicism just because we see all of our friends who are successful and they're all Catholic? I have heard of a conversion story that way. A person said, all my friends were Catholic and they were all successful. I figured they must be doing something right. So I became Catholic. Not the best motivation. It wasn't the best motivation to get into the church, but maybe it worked out for him in the long run. Are we looking for a Messiah other than Jesus Christ? Because these three columns here were, or the, the three types of um, uh, the three types of relations he had, whether it's prosperity, whether it's political power, whether it's people who do awesome signs and they, they think that that's going to be their savior. Of course not. But Jesus is now taking on the life of the Israelites, and there's no reason to believe that he's not taking on our lives as well when we look for a savior somewhere else. Where we could say, oh, uh, um, if Jesus really loved me, he'd take care of me. Uh, he really loves you, and he'd take care of your soul. He's not going to give us a bunch of money. He's going to give us exactly what we need. So all these, um, uh, the, the temptations have many aspects many aspects of it and it's uh, awesome to, to believe and it's awesome to, to look into them and I'm just giving you two the, the idea of that he's picking up where the Israelites picked up uh, let us down and he's redoing the life of them but and then also he's being tempted to become a different type of Messiah than originally planned one that would have to suffer he's in the desert for days obviously he's suffering right there he's hungry he's experiencing I'm sure loneliness hunger thirst, abandonment, 
all of this type of suffering that he's going through is just a foreshadowing of what he's going to uh, experience on the cross. But he is experiencing the same human emotions. Oh, yes. Zell's one of the Romans gone that kind of finishes our part. So, But we move on that Jesus had other temptations as well. And basically, just in, he had the, the temptations in the desert, but then two other ones. One of them, and the major one that we've all heard on a Sunday Mass, it's always fun to uh, quote Jesus on this one when he yells at Peter, get behind me, Satan. You know, we have Peter's temptation of Christ. Even his most beloved followers had this idea that this, the, the, the Messiah would not have to suffer. Like this, this just didn't compute with them. Why would the, why would the Messiah have to suffer? Isaiah 53 didn't, didn't compute with them that that was going to be one person picking up the infirmities of all. So Peter, he hears them uh, he hears Jesus. And Jesus uh, asks uh, his apostles and says, who, who do you think the Son of Man is? Or what do they say about the Son of Man? What do they say about me? What do you hear about me? It's like some think you're Elijah. Some, uh, some think you're a great prophet. So what do you think, Simon Barjona? And Simon says, I think you are the Christ, the Son of the, the, son of the living God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. But then Jesus has immediately going into saying that the, the Messiah is going to have to suffer. Peter says, surely this will not happen to you. And this is where we get the, the quote below us. Actually, no, this is just after. That's when Jesus yells at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. He's being tempted again, just like he was in the desert, to not have to suffer. Finally, a person just tells Jesus right out, you're the Christ. You're, you're, you're the Savior. Doesn't it? Peter and the apostles still haven't thought that this guy's got to suffer for us. Why not become a political leader? Why not just do miracles all the time? If you're God, miracles aren't hard. Why not just continue to do that? Why not continue to feed us from the bread from heaven? Uh, but then Jesus rebukes him. He says, no, get behind me, Satan. And then he says the cost of discipleship. Then he says the real cost of what discipleship looks like. Right there at the bottom of the page, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For, whatever, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what can one give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay everyone according to his conduct. Amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So this, this temptation from Peter is, you know, saying you don't have to suffer. But Jesus is saying, like, no, this is what, it, this is what the cost is, actually. This is what it costs to be a disciple. Laying down your life, whoever wishes to save it loses it, and whoever loses it for my sake will gain it for eternity. This probably didn't make sense to them. This probably didn't compute with them. So this temptation, too, is, you know, Peter doesn't know what he's saying. He's not evil. But this is why Jesus tells him to get behind me, Satan. It's just the same thing he heard in the desert. You shouldn't have to suffer. But Jesus lays down his life to show what an actual sacrifice really is. The next temptation that he, you know, Christ has, the crucifixion brings all these back. The passion, all, this brings all the stuff back. All the, the same ones from the, the desert as well. Because the agony in the garden, while it doesn't exactly uh, mention bread, so to speak, it does say, uh, let, Jesus says, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. So deep, we're going to talk about that quote a lot, especially that that quote tells us a lot about uh, Jesus, his human nature and his divine nature. And we'll talk more about this in a couple lessons. But this quote, along with a couple other ones, this really gets to the heart of what Jesus is amongst the, the hypostatic union of having two natures. So he's being tempted in the agony in the garden to again not have to suffer. 
Because Jesus' human nature, it's only right that human nature actually flees from pain. So Jesus having this temptation to flee from pain, flee, flee from not being hungry anymore in the desert. It's the same kind of thing, to flee from this hunger pain that a person would have. Again, the thieves on the crosses next to Jesus are asking for a sign. If you are the Messiah, save yourself and us. You know, one of them does turn good in the last moments of his life, but the other one doesn't. And just kind of yells at him. Oh, if you're the Messiah, save us. He doesn't care about Jesus saving his own life. He's like, he, uh, he wants to be saved by Jesus. So it's kind of this idea that the same temptations that were in the desert are coming back to him right on the cross. And then right across the top. The, the post that Pilate puts up, the king of the Jews, bringing this notion of king back up. And Pilate asking him, if you are a king, where is your kingdom? He says, his kingdom is not of this earth. So we hear, we see all this, okay? Now, I, I know I've beaten this dead horse a lot. But the temptations it, are showing that he has given us this perfect model to not be, to look for a Messiah, not to look for a Messiah that does anything but suffer. Not uh, uh, to look for the, the Messiah to offer his life for the sake of his beloved. So we're going to move into a little bit different of, of, a, of approach here. But I, I found that the temptations were, the, at least in my head, the best launching pad to go into a different topic. Because it, it does kind of tie in together in the smallest way. And that is this idea of um, if, if Christ is perfect... How can he actually be tempted, right? Because if he knows how things end, is it really a temptation? Well, we know how things end sometimes, but we're still tempted to take a different route. So to go down this route, to go down this question that seems kind of loaded, we have to talk a little bit about the knowledge, Christ's knowledge. What did he actually know? Did he know the end game of what this looked like? Did he know the future? Did he know... Uh, all of what's going on with his life because we can be tempted in many ways but if we know the end it's, sometimes we're like eh, it's not that much of temptation because I know how this story ends so there's three types of knowledge and this will come back to the temptation part there's acquired knowledge this is basic human knowledge this is what's this kind of knowledge is a proper to humans we, we learn from experience of whether it's experience of actually doing something or reading about it or listening or we, we learn from that kind of experience, right? And then there's infused knowledge. God will put something on your mind and tell you to do something that you had no idea that you were supposed to do, but you, he's telling you to do something, like command, and that's the same kind of thing. Like, I know God's telling me to do something right now. That's, in, that's what's called infused knowledge. And then there's a beatific vision. This is much different from the other two. The beatific vision is knowing, seeing heaven, seeing all the outcomes of all the actions. Uh, th this, is, this is the whole works, right? Um, right now we're going to talk about acquired knowledge. Acquired knowledge is proper to human beings. This is how we learn. We learn from experience, reading, listening. You know, uh, uh, that, that's just property humans. Now, um... That, that, that's just what it is. So, but, and this is how Jesus, there's a line that gives a lot of uh, theologians some trouble, or I should just say anybody who reads it. Uh, how can Jesus learn anything? He already knows everything. You know, and it says at the end of this chapter, Luke chapter 2, and Jesus advanced in wisdom and age before, in favor before God and man. So if Jesus knows everything, how can he grow in wisdom? Well, there's a certain element, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a minute, but for right now, there's a certain element that I can get directions on how to assemble a cabinet or a piece of furniture from Ikea, right? You buy the box, you get tons of pieces, I got the directions, I know how to assemble it. Sure. But you can give that to a person, and just because they have the directions on how to do it and how it's supposed to look like, it's different from experiencing it and putting it together, right? And you got all the parts, you see all the bags, you see all the different types of screws, you look at the instruction manual. Yeah, you can say like, yeah, I can figure it out. That figuring it out is the part 
of experiencing it. So Jesus can actually grow in knowledge in the sense of actually coming down to our level and experiencing it. And this gets the part of the divine condescension, uh, <laughs> condescension, condescension, coming down to our level and experiencing it. And actually experiencing what hunger feels like. Experiencing what thirst feels like. Experiencing what pain feels like. And this is the part of the first quote that we read at the very beginning. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So that idea of him uh, advanced and growing in wisdom is his wisdom is finally experiencing what it's like to be a human. That actual emotions, the passions of having certain things like that. Because it doesn't really diminish his, his glory, but it actually picks it up and saying like, he, now he knows what it's actually like to experience this. So that's acquired knowledge, right? We're going to come back to a lot of these. And we got infused knowledge. This is proper to the angels. Now this is a complicated subject, but angels only know what God has put into them when they were created. That's what they know. They don't experience things because they don't have human bodies. They don't have uh, passions like the same we do. They don't have emotions. They are set in stone. They, they are uh, but, you know, you can't touch them. You, you can feel them, but you can't. Th th that this kind of knowledge is proper to angels. It can happen to humans, where all of a sudden you just know something. And, or, or, or there's a lot of spiritual mystics have claimed this that they've had something just implanted on their soul. The example that always comes to mind: some people just love her, so take her with a grain of salt. Blessed Catherine Emmerich. Blessed Catherine Emmerich sees a lot, like not just sees in real life, but, and this is back in the 1800s, if I'm not mistaken, the 1800s and 1900s, that she would be in deep prayer and she would have these glimpses of what the crucifixion was like, of what St. Joseph, the relationship between Joseph and Mary was like. So this type of infused knowledge, it, when it happens to humans, I'm not saying you should just automatically believe it because you're opening the door to a lot of uh, interesting things, but Blessed Catherine Emmerich has been tried and true for a lot of people, and they love her visions, uh, um, but she claims it all to infuse knowledge, that angels have given her, or God has given her this knowledge of the angels to see what things were like. And then you have the beatific vision. This, no, this type of knowledge is extremely just proper to God. To know all, to see all, to experience uh, not experience, but to to know what the future beholds if everyone does these certain actions, to know every chain of consequences that follows, and then also along with heaven itself. So this this idea of vision is one that's very interesting. So I remember being in, in seminary, and the, the Christology course was talking about this very thing, and our my professor brought up, he asked a question to the class. He didn't do this too often, but he, he wanted us to discuss amongst ourselves. He said, did, did Jesus have faith? And all of us just kind of stopped for a moment. You could kind of feel the wheels turning and everyone's like, did Jesus have faith? Like there's something, there's something odd about that to say if he actually had faith. Because faith inquires, it begs the question that there, it's only faithful if there's something walking out into the unknown. But Jesus knew all. So how could he know all but have faith? Well, he did have faith in a certain sense because the perfection of faith is what we call vision. He, Jesus didn't have faith in the strict sense. He had it in the broad sense of saying he knew everything and he had vision. He walked his whole life was a complete handing over to the Father. And he walked in this, uh, this notion of what's called vision that he didn't walk into the unknown. He knew what was happening. He knew what day he was getting crucified. He knew what it was going to be like. It was going to be miserable. But there's a big difference of knowing it's going to be miserable and then once you're in the moment of actually feeling the misery. So Jesus had this beatific vision, the knowledge only proper to God. So he didn't exactly have faith like we do. 
Because our faith, it really is a movement of taking our present actions, this right moral action, and putting them into the unknown. Of when the unknown happens, the, one, the, the times that our faith is tested, of, right, uh, of acting rightly in, a, in accordance with God's will. Because we don't know the future, because we don't have that beatific vision. We only experience acquired knowledge. And if you're lucky, infused, but the vast majority of us will not experience that. But the, uh, the idea of vision here is where Jesus, it's a little bit different. He didn't have faith, he had vision, the perfection of it. And it's only when we get to heaven, we will have that perfection as well. And I brought this, I should have mentioned this earlier. This is, a, this is from the Hebrews chapter 11, the, the, the famous quote about faith. Faith is a realization of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Because of it, the ancients were well attested. By faith, we understand that the universe was ordered by the word of God so that what is visible came into being through the invisible. So that, that's that notion for us that we're, our faith is kind of walking into the unknown a little bit. The unknown of the future the unknown of what other people are going to do to us. Jesus knew what was going to happen, but yet it's a little bit different from his version because he still had to do it, experience to gain that human knowledge. Now, um, to have the, the this beatific vision includes acquired knowledge, but there's a, a priest who wrote about this a little bit. His name is Father Garely the Grange, and he wrote a uh, very interesting man, very interesting priest. He died in the 60s, I believe, and he was one of John Paul II's professors. He, he taught in one of the seminaries that John Paul II went, before he was Pope, obviously. When Carol Watiwa was in seminary, Gary Lou Grange taught, taught him a couple philosophy courses, if I'm not mistaken. So he gives us this quote that's going to help us out a little bit about Christ-acquired knowledge. This quote here. Christ acquired knowledge was not made useless by reason of his superior knowledge. For even though experience taught him the same things he already knew by other means, it taught him to know them in a different way. He foresaw far in advance an infallibility that he would be crucified at, at, at a given hour on a certain day. Yet when the moment of crucifixion came, the experience of pain taught him in a way something new that no provision could reveal to him in the same degree. So I guess the, the point is of, of this whole lesson, Christ has entered into our, our fullness here. He's entered into our level to have to learn something. And this, uh, uh, he's entered into the relationships that we've had the saviors that we think we can find. And he's going to become that savior in, in, in so much more of a greater way. This, this has always been of a joke, and I meant to bring this up earlier. I remember I used to be a carpenter. A lot of, all of you probably know that. But every once in a while I get teased. And if somebody would mess something up, someone, and we, we kind of give each other trouble sometimes, he's like, hey, man, there's only one perfect car carpenter, and they killed him. You, you know, and, and so... Uh, it was this idea that Jesus was a carpenter. He would have learned how to do this stuff too. There's no doubt he was a good carpenter. But the joke was, it's like, did Jesus need a level? <laughs> Why would he need a level if he knew what was level? Why would he need, need uh, certain tools, it, uh, whether it be a plumb line or uh, a square or a tape measure, if he knew what, they obviously didn't have tape measures, but the point was, why would he need certain tools if he was perfect and he knew everything. It begs the question, kind of makes, makes you wonder a little bit. Did he need certain tools? Did he use his uh, infused knowledge of how to make a, a table that's square? Or did he go ahead and use the tools to learn how to use them? I joke that he only needed a level once. Then, once he experienced what level was, he didn't need it anymore. He knew what it was. Is that true? I don't know. Does it matter? Probably not. But it's the idea that when 
our knowledge is limited because we forget things. He would not have forgot anything. He wouldn't know all, but yet I make the analogy, and this is, this is I'm not going to say this is anti-Catholic teaching. I've just never looked into this. I, I believe that Jesus had the notion at every moment to know exactly what everybody had going on in their mind at the moment or to, uh, to, to know everyone's name if he met somebody and just to call it out. But he decided to lay that weapon down and say, I'm not going to use my knowledge here and I'm going to be like you in every possible way. I'm going to learn like you. I'm going to be hungry like you. I'm going to be um, just like the humans as much as I possibly can, as much as I humanly possibly can, but without sin. So when people will joke, like, did Jesus know uh, everything that was going to go on? Yes, he did know everything that was going to go on in the crucifixion. Did he know the people's names who maybe stabbed him? Or did he know uh, some of the people that he was going to run in into on the way? Did he know Veronica was going to wipe his face? Did he know Simon was going to help pick up the cross? I think he had the possibility to know. But I think he laid that down in going into the unknown as much as possible. It's a belief. Could someone prove me wrong? Sure. Is it going to change my uh, faith? I hope not. But I think Jesus also wanted to learn. He wanted to be surprised. He wanted to feel hungry, feel tired. That's why he slept on the boat. That's why he asked, do you have anything to eat after the resurrection? He wanted to become like us. And now that he's become like us in every way but possibly sin, now he can correct the way we were supposed to act. He can say that you don't need the political messiahs. You don't need the signs. Trust in them. Trust in the sacraments. Trust in the grace that God's given us. You don't need the, the prosperity of what the world will promise you. And I think that's where we put ourselves in the story. Put ourselves in the temptations. To say, uh, Jesus took all those temptations from us and acted rightly. Thanks be to God. Because it only takes the perfect person to do that once. And that is the perfect model of how that we should be doing that. At the Last Supper, he said, I've given you a model to follow. You know, one does not have the greatest love that a person has is to lay down his life for his friends. And he's given, I've given you a model to follow. And that is the kind of life that we're supposed to live. That self-sacrifice one, the one that does not suffer, the, the one that does not shy away from suffering for the sake of another person. Because the world now says, oh, you should be comfortable. Everything should be hunky-dory. If, you, if, if you're not happy, that, that means um, that something's got to change. Offer up that suffering for, that per, for, for your love, for your, your loved one. So uh, take that uh, temptation here that Jesus is not, he, he, he could not fail, but he knows what we're going through in the temptations. There's no doubt about that. He knows what it was like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to have to learn how things are going to be going. He knows what it's like to have to look into the unknown and maybe not know something. Uh, all because I think he laid that knowledge down for the sake of becoming like us in every way. Any questions? No way. What? No questions. Oh, yeah. Earlier you So there's two ways to look at that. The sign of Jonah, you know, I, I would like to think that we know the, the sign of Jonah. The, the obvious one is being dead for three days. Um, being dead for three days and rising. That would be the sign of Jonah. So that's the future sign when uh, it, that, you know, when he says that, they don't know that he's going to die. He does. But he's like, no sign will be given you except for the sign of Jonah. Being dead for three days and coming out of death. But the other sign of Jonah that some uh, theologians project of what this is, is that a massive amount of people will convert. Because Jonah, he didn't like the city of Nineveh. He kind of wanted them to die. He kind of was like, you know, I don't really, he's like, God, I don't want to go to talk to the Assyrians and, and Ninevites. Um, they're not going to listen. 
Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go tell them what you're telling me. But the sign of Jonah is that a massive amount of people converted, because when Jonah did go to Nineveh and said, you know, death to you all unless you repent, much to his surprise, everybody repented. So that's one version of looking at it that the sign of Jonah was a lot of people will convert, and the Pharisees didn't want that. So the, this is a, the Pharisees asking for that sign. So one way of looking at it. And I think both are right, you know, both and. I don't understand why it couldn't be both, but I do like to hear theologians' takes on both sides. That the sign of Jonah is that a person will be dead for three days and rise, and that a massive amount of people will convert when offered of saying, repent and believe in the gospel. So that, that was the sign of Jonah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. I hope you're uh, taking a lot in. Let's end in a uh, small prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right.